wanted to teach math and I wanted to coach. Why did I want to even be involved with math? I have no idea. Just something, something I liked. And uh, now I know why I wanted to coach because I found out winning is fun. And uh, grew up in a very just great, great Christian home. And, and if you, you don't like me saying Ohio, this is going to get better here. I, I grew up in the holy city of Ohio, Cleveland. <laughs> Grew up in a, just a fine Christian home. Dad and mom just loved the Lord. Went to a Swedish Baptist convention church. Uh, all four of, of we children all trusted Christ as our Savior and uh, served the Lord, and we're thankful for that. Uh, my dad would read the Bible every day for, for the entire family. Mom used to read the daily bread. Both dad and mom are in heaven. Uh, when I graduated from uh, Baptist Bible College in Springfield, Missouri, uh, I felt like I wanted to become a chaplain in the Air Force at Rickenbacker Air Force Base, but when I found out that uh, this was after the process had already begun uh, with, with the uh, service, when I found out I would be moving every three years, I, I, just, I just didn't think I was cut out for that. So uh, we, we stopped the process and ended up taking a church in Columbus and stayed there for 30 years, started the Christian school, worked in the inner city ghetto area for 23 of those 30 years, and God moved us out to the suburbs, and uh, the, the, just a wonderful ministry. Uh, for 29 of those 30 years, our church supported the Fellowship Track League. And, and not only thank you to vets today, uh, but thank you church today for being a male center church, sending out 5.8 million gospel tracts. That is, that is remarkable. There's 18 such churches at last count, now that, that changes constantly, around the country and world that do exactly what your church does because the track lead cannot get out all the orders. Uh, we have a minimum of 700 that the track lead puts out every week, and that could be an order from several hundred tracks up to maybe a million tracks. It's very difficult to get all that wrapped up together, so uh, once the orders go on overflow, we ship out the emails and the labels to all of the centers around the world according to where the interest is where the tracks have to be shipped, and every church has to guarantee that they'll spend anywhere between $200 to $400 a month in postage to make sure the tracks go out free. Uh, Brother Wash Pennington, who is the founder of the church and the ministry of the Fellowship Track League there in the greater Cincinnati, Ohio area. <laughs> uh, it was uh, the mission statement that every track would be printed and given away free of charge, and that includes the shipping. So from 1978 until today, we've now surpassed 4.9 billion gospel tracks given away free of charge all over the world. It is a ministry of faith, and... That was the idea behind when they started it, that they would continue to send out tracts on a, a free basis as long as the Lord provided. So they needed people to go around and raise interest and awareness and money. <laughs> well, that's always intertwined there, isn't it? And uh, th when I joined up in, oh, seven or eight years ago, there were five other reps and within the first year, year and a half, they all uh, left the uh, representative ministry of the track league and went back to pastoring churches. They just, it was just a tough time staying on the road, trying to raise their support, because as, as a rep, we have to live by faith too, and we have to raise our support from churches just like yourselves. So a third thank you, you know, they say the third time is a what? A charm. So I'm trying to charm you here. <laughs> Uh, thank you for your monthly support. I have to pay all the bills out of my own pocket and, of course, the home expenses and things like that. So uh, we just uh, travel by faith. I, I thought I would try it for a year because I have a pastor's heart, a shepherd's heart. I love pastoring. I thought within a year when I stepped down, the Lord would have me somewhere else uh, pastoring, but not so. So giving the track league a year to travel uh, has now turned to, what, seven, eight years traveling for them. And I didn't quite understand the traveling ministry at first, uh, but I got my rhythm, and now for 260 straight Sundays, I've been in churches for the track league in about a seven or eight state region. 
And uh, we just love what we do. We love uh, sharing what the track league ministry is. We're still in churches that have never heard about the track league ministry, even though it's the largest gospel track printing ministry in the history of the world. Just an amazing ministry. People say, well, uh, we don't see any modern-day miracles like we see in the Bible. Well, just look at the ministry that you, you're financing and involved with, the Fellowship Track League, to have almost approach 5 billion gospel tracks, and the church uh, only runs about 75, maybe 85, 95 people on a Sunday morning. Someone says, well, how, how can a church that size have the largest printing ministry in the history of the world? I don't know. It must be all... God, and that's what it is, and that's what our life should be. That's what our testimony should be. It's all about God. So the church that size, and, you know, if it's not a church of 2,000, someone says, well, it's a church 2,000, and uh, no one will think anything about it, but a church of 75 that's been able to do that, you, you know it's a miracle from God, and he gets all the glory, Amen. and that's the way our life should be as well. Uh, you have one of these coin banks I saw sitting in the bank there. Uh, this used to be a roll of paper. cost $250 when its paper's all rolled off. Prints 125,000 tracks. When these go to, say, the Philippines, uh, at least four people will read each track as it's handed out. So now four times 125,000. One can reach 500,000 people with the gospel of Christ. We don't even have to go. We just need to help buy the rolls of paper because those who have gone, they need a first point of contact with the people of the country they've gone to, and we print in 90 foreign languages, so the gospel track that they give is from us free of charge, including the shipping. These are the tracks that they're handing out to people in all the countries around the world. You look at your missionary letters back there, really by doing what you're doing, you're actually supporting probably 80% of the missionaries around the world. You don't have enough space to put up all those letters because the Great Commission is in what? Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world. And so all the missionaries that get these tracks free, really you are help sponsoring and supplying their need. So your ministry is so much greater than maybe you have ever thought. If you're not involved in maybe that uh, uh, male center part of this church's ministry, maybe you're doing something else, maybe one of the days uh, you could show up and just see what really goes on. It's an unbelievable ministry. And I uh, leave these coin banks. This, this is the roll of paper. We turn them into coin banks each end. We put a little slick thing on the front. Next time you, you see a penny, don't step over it. One penny will print five tracks. I've now left over 1,500 coin banks all over this country, and people fill them up left and right. We have one church that fills it up by poundage. They, they weigh it. They have like five-gallon buckets across the front of the auditorium, and uh, in my travels, at least, uh, the record that uh, was set by them was 570 pounds of change. You have no idea how heavy that is. Ended up being thousands and thousands of dollars prints millions and millions of tracts. The church that took most, the most coin banks is the Maslin Baptist Temple, a Maslin Baptist College, a Maslin Christian Day School, and they have a lot of teachers there. And They took 34 coin banks, and they have competitions between the classes and the Sunday schools and the staff. A lot of money is raised through this. Uh, we had one man who took two after the service when I got done preaching. He said, can I fill these up right now? I said, right now? Uh, I don't know if you've seen inside, but there, you know, that's a lot of change. You just don't carry that much change around, and you just don't. He came back after the service was over. He took it after the service, took two next door, came back, had them filled up, and we said, how did you do that? And a lady piped up and said, Brother Lapis, he owns the laundromat next to the church. He emptied, <laughs> he emptied every washing machine, dryer, pop machine, you name it, candy machine, and gave it all from just two days of his business to the Lord to reach people around the world with the gospel. God just touches hearts of people everywhere we go. Uh, the church that bought the most rolls of papers, the, the old record, in fact, last time I was here, uh, that church still held it. It was in Albuquerque, New Mexico. In one three-day mission conference, they bought 17 rolls of paper from their congregation, and that record has stayed. I've been trying to get churches to break that record wherever I go, and I, of course, a lot of time I, I am in Ohio. Uh, being in Columbus, I just head out two hours any direction there, 
And I, I, can't, I could not find a church in Ohio to break that record. I went to Michigan, could not find out any churches in Michigan to break that record. Finally, there was a church in Ohio that has about 40 people in it. In one mission conference, they bought 25 rolls of people from their 35 or 40 people. Something about the Holy Spirit of God just touches hearts of people everywhere I go. And sometimes it's years after the fact where the people just can't get away from this ministry, and left and right, they, they just really jump in on some level, and it's just an amazing uh, ministry. We'd love to have a, a group from your church. I, I understand now after that, brother, you've got a lot of vehicles here. You can get a lot of people in. We'd love to have you come up to the track league. It's probably four, maybe a five-hour trip from here, something like that. For one, one of our Tuesday work days, they assemble the tracks on, on a much larger basis, just like you do here. And it's amazing. We have a, now a second printing press, uh, we couldn't keep up with the crush of calls from around the world in our country because everybody wants tracks, missionaries want more tracks, and we can supply them. So we added the second printing press hoping we could catch up. We're further behind than ever. On the back of each one of our tracks is the website. People get on our website from all over the world, and we now have over 2 million hits a month on the ministry website, fellowshiptrackleague.org. All you have to do is type in Fellowship Track League. You can go on there, look at the 80-plus topical tracks we have in English, the 90 foreign tracks that we print in. You can order any amount. You can call them, fax them, email them. You can actually go there, just walk in and walk out with a, with a van full of tracks if you want. So uh, it's just amazing how they're doing this, and God is blessing it because it is, again, a ministry of faith. I have a, a relative, young man, He's a member of the Assembly of God, obviously different than, than our, our, our Baptist uh, persuasion and faith and doctrine. Uh, a good Christian young man, nevertheless. He told me that uh, he wanted to pastor a church, and he wanted me to pray for him. And uh, there were churches in his uh, denomination that were looking for pastors, but he didn't want to do that. I said, well, why don't you just take a, a church that, within your denomination that needs a young man to pastor he says, I want to start a church from scratch. I said, why do you want to do that? And he said this to me. He said, I want to stretch my faith. When's the last time we've heard anybody say that, that they wanted to stretch their faith? Most of us, myself included, our faith sometimes goes about as far as we can see, and it ends and it's really a very small part of what really faith is. So uh, he wanted to do that, so I share that everywhere I go. Can you stretch your faith for the world? Jesus didn't come for any reason except to seek and to save that which is lost. I only brought one of these in, uh, kind of hard to fill up uh, the vehicle with this. If you'd like this, I'm going to leave it right here. Anybody can grab it. You don't have to say a thing, just fill it up. I was in Rensselaer, Indiana. Uh, I, I, I had to get to a Sunday school. It started at 8 a.m. Now, if your pastor proposed that, how many would vote for an 8 a.m. Sunday school? That's what I thought. That's what I thought. Who has Sunday school at 8 a.m.? But if you want to go, there it is. So I got up at 3 a.m. to drive there and got there in time. Didn't have a lot of people. There's a little teenage girl about 14 years old. After service, she said, Brother Lapish, can I have one of those coin banks? And I said, sure. Later that day, I got a text from her pastor that she had gone out door to door all Sunday afternoon and had it filled to the brim with change and bills and checks for missionaries to get tracts all over the world. You know, we hear so many ugly things about young people today. Well, there was one young person who went out and put feet to her action and prayers of winning people to Christ around the world. It can be done. It's a good teen activity. But now I'm starting to ramble. We, we did have a DVD, brother. Did, past tense. You can hold on to that, and your pastor can show it some other service. Uh, how many would like me to get you out by five after? <laughs> five after? Well, that, I can do that. I, I'm looking at your clock unless it's not right there. <laughs> But uh, 2 Corinthians 5, verse number 7. Paul says here, for we, and here's my key word here. I'm just going to kind of lift this word as an idea. For we walk by faith, not by sight. 
I had a knee replacement in 2012. It still doesn't work good. Uh, the guy who did it, he didn't get it really lined up, so my foot goes to the right, my kneecap goes to the left. For those of you who've had it, hurts all the time. I went in to see them. They said, live with it, you know. So uh, if, I, if I had a run, as Paul says over there in 1 Corinthians 9, he says we run a race. If I had a run, I'd be in trouble. Probably some of you would too. <laughs> but Paul says here, for we walk by faith, not by sight. I'd like to talk to you quickly this morning on the thought, a walk with God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, so good to be here today, and Pastor Price, and Lord, we're glad that uh, this church has been involved in being a mail center for the track league and has sent out millions and millions of tracks. May you bless this church in a mighty way and smile upon her. We do pray for all the veterans and their extended families, and Lord, we're just thankful for the job they have done for their family, their country, but most of all, for thee. Bless America. Bless this message. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. I have five points. Uh, by the way, my dad passed away in 2000. <clears throat> if he were alive today and the Lord would let him come back, he would not recognize our country, I don't think. So many things have changed in the 19 going on 20 years. So one way we can kind of put a stop to what's going on in our country is, is embodied in this message today, a walk with God. I'd like to look at five instances when we see the word walk used in the Bible and see what teaching is connected with it. And the very first time the word walk is used is in Genesis chapter 3. I will just read, and they, that's Adam and Eve, heard the voice of the Lord God walking. First time the word walk is used is right here in the book of beginnings. And the Lord God was walking with Adam and Eve in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. Very first time we find the word walk, we find humans walking with God. What a wonderful, uh, symbolic, and, and important a uh, picture we have of Adam and Eve walking in the cool of the day with the Lord. You say, well, that's great, but, but how can we do that? Well, every day we can walk in the word of God with the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, the Lord said there in verse 8, he called unto them in verse 9, Adam, where art thou? Every day I kind of feel like when I wake up in the morning and uh, I get out of bed, it, it feels like I hear the Lord from the Bible saying to me, Timothy, where art thou? He's waiting for me to share the Scriptures with me, and as I walk through the Scriptures, He builds me and guides me and teaches me. I don't know what it would be like to try to go through a day of any week, of any month, of any year when I haven't started that day by walking with Christ in the Scriptures. Do you walk with Christ in the Scripture every day as Adam and Eve walked in the garden with the Lord God as well? We, we can. There's nothing stopping us. We just have to make sure we, we put it in our schedule of the day. And I, I can't remember the last time I've missed walking with the Lord in the Scripture in the morning as I live my life. What a great life I have because... I was taught that from my dad and mom, who both walked in the scriptures with the Lord daily. And I picked that up, and now my children walk with the Lord daily in the scriptures. If for some reason you've got away from that, can I encourage you today to begin that walk with the Lord again? Point two, Amos 3.3 3 says, Can two walk together except they be agreed? Boy, sometimes it's hard to walk together, huh? Now, I, I was trying to walk with you here when I got up here. <laughs> there it is. Can two walk together except they be agreed? Agreed on what? Well, number one, we should be, be agreed doctrinally as members of, of this church here. Are you in agreement with the church's doctrine? When's the last time anybody has read the doctrinal statement of your church. 
I don't know. Something to think about. In the Sunday school material that we, we used at our church, they always had uh, 14 doctrinal statements inside the front cover and then another 14 doctrinal statements inside the back cover. And every Sunday before Sunday school, we'd read one from the inside and one from the back side. And within 14 weeks, we'd go over 28 very important doctrines that our church stood for and believed. And it, it shows us why we are what we are and maybe not some other denomination out there. So it needs to be important that we are doctrinally agreed with the church doctrinal statement. I think we need to be agreed in what a, a Bible home is. That's what dad is the head of the home. Right, man? Right, man. <laughs> a week. <laughs> and the ladies who follow their husbands. Right, women? <laughs> and the kids? Well, you don't have any rights. <laughs> You're... As my dad told me when I was, you know, feeling my spirit strong as a teenager, and I, I wanted my own way, and I remember my mom told my dad something I did that was wrong that day, and uh, he, he would look at me, and discipline was coming. Dad was a big man, 6'3", 250. Say, what happened to you, Brother Tim? <laughs> mom was 4'11", 100 pounds. Hmm, thanks a lot, Mom. That went my career. <laughs> So when I get in the fight, first thing I do, I'll punch your kneecap out. <laughs> she would tell my dad, and my dad would look at me, discipline would come in, and I'd look up and I said, Dad, you didn't hear my side of the story. He would look down, he said, son, you don't have any side, you don't have any rights, you're lucky I feed you. <laughs> hey, you know, about that I said, you know, I'm pretty lucky I'm getting fed here. So that's what a real Bible home is, the dad the mom, and the children, with Christ being head over all of right. us. Right. My dad led our home. Military man, as I said. No way I was ever going to get hair down over my ears in the 60s and 70s living in that home. You know, ex-war man like dad was. Uh, very powerful man in many ways of his life. But uh, mom, she just loved dad to death. She followed his leadership. Boy, my dad treated her. Remember that show years ago, Queen for a Day? When my mom married my dad, it was Queen for her life. That's how he took care of her. And we kids, mom and dad hugged us and told us they loved us, made sure we got an ed education, made sure we were disciplined when we needed it, and they raised us the right way. If I've done anything wrong, that's on me entirely. No reflection on my dad or mom. Are we agreed how a church operates with pastor as the leader and the guider and shepherd of the church? I'll just leave it right there. I mean, we're all agreed on that. We're all smiling too, right? 30 years when I pastored, when the church followed my leadership, you know what? Things went well. We grew. But every once in a while, we'd have someone who just thought they could do it better or a different way and, and it was superior. And boy, our church would come to a screeching halt till we got that thing resolved. And then once they realized, we'll get behind a pastor who's God called, ordained leader of the church, which Christ established. Once we got everything in line again, things went well. Doesn't mean that I made every, everything I wanted to do was great. Uh, I had some ideas that we'd meet with our deacons and, and uh, they'd cough out loud and go, oh, you want to do what? You know, and, and I, I, smart enough to listen to right. them. Right. I had great deacons. Not one of them wanted to be the pastor, but they all wanted what was best for their church. Right. And so I, 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 I didn't mind anybody disagreeing with me. Sometimes actually uh, when they voted against what I wanted to do, I actually thanked them afterwards. I said, I probably would have made a big mistake. So I, I, I you know, really love that relationship that the pastor has with this church, and it's very important that we get behind him so the church can go forward. Point three, Jeremiah 6.16 says to walk in the old ways. Revelation 13, or excuse me, Romans 13.13 13 says walk honestly. Can you be trusted? Can I be trusted? It's really important that we live honestly inside our home and out in public, that people know that we are honest people. 
used to be years back, and I know I'm going back quite a way to church I pastored. When I went to it in downtown Columbus, they had 17 uh, senior citizens left. I was in my 20s. But uh, those men told me in the early teens and 20s when they were growing up, a lot of times for contracts, they'd just shake hands, and that was it because the person's word was their bond. Today they're taking fingerprints, thumbprints, pictures of your eye, drawn blood. I mean, they just they want to know where you live. They have your, uh, their GPS set to your home if they need to come find you. If you buy a car, they've got something in the car in case you don't pay. There, I, just, nobody trusts anybody. Seems honesty is lacking. But the Bible teaches us the old way is when you and I walk in honesty. It says in Micah 6, 8, to walk humbly. It says in Ephesians 5, 13, to walk circumspectly. I had a, I had a man in that downtown area of Columbus in that giant ghetto there that, that's down there, and uh, he got saved. He was an alcoholic. He was in his 20s. He had a sweet wife and daughter who had been saved at our church there and finally got him to come, and he got saved. And uh, his problem was, though, he was a roofer by trade. He got saved in the summer on a Sunday, so on Monday he was on the roof, and, and they were telling bad jokes, and they are doing this and doing that. And uh, they looked at him, and they said, Hey, we'll call his name Bob. Hey, hey, Bob, how come you're not laughing at our jokes? Bob says, Because I got me religion yesterday. Now, he didn't understand that how to say he got saved or was born again. He got him religion. And they looked at him, and they laughed. They said, you're pulling our leg. Well, after that day's work was over, the same bar they always went to, they said, Bob, we'll see you at the bar. And they took off in their pickup trucks, and he followed. And uh, when they got out of their trucks, they looked at him. He just waved. They couldn't believe it. You know, they wrote him all summer about going to the bar afterward. Finally, he caved in. He says, all right, I'll go play a game of pool, but all I'm having is a bottle of water, then I'm heading home. And that's all he did. But he started going all the time, and you, you can probably guess what the story's going to be. Finally, that bottle of water turned into a bottle of beer. He got drunk. He went home. He tore up his house, used the most vile language, threatened his wife, threatened his daughter. When he came to the next day, he realized what he had done. They came to church on Sunday. He hit the altar. They called for me to go down during the invitation. He told me what had happened, and I felt bad for the guy. Everybody else did who heard the story. And I took him the, the, here in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15, where it says to walk circumspectly. And I says, this is what you've got to do, Bob. You've got to walk circumspectly. He says, I don't even know what that word means. I said, well, when you were in high school, remember geometry about circumference? He says, I quit school when I was in sixth grade. Hmm. Well, that's a tough one now. And in just like a nanosecond, the Lord gave me an idea. And I says, listen, Bob, here's what walking circumspectly means. Do you have to go by that bar every day to get home? He says, yeah, it's the closest way. I said, Bob, is there another way you could go all the way around to get home and never go past that bar? He says, yes, but it'd take me 10 minutes longer. I said, Bob, would you rather get home 10 minutes later and be sober or drive past that bar and end up in the drunken stupor again? He said, preacher, I got it. Walk circumspectly. You know, I think sometimes, if we're not careful, we as Christians, we live too close to the edge, very close to the edge of sin and maybe temptations that are unique to all of us. I heard a pastor at one meeting years back telling a story about a king up in the Alps at a castle, and uh, he had a cart, and the horses would pull that carriage, that cart, and uh, the guy who was doing it died, so they were taking... Uh, people in to be the next person who would drive that carriage. And one man said, I am so good. As I go around the Alps, I can get within one foot of the edge and, and, and the cart will never fall over. One guy says, I can get within two inches of the edge and it'll never fall over. He, the king didn't hire any of those. You know who he hired? The guy who said he'd hug the inside wall of that mountain. In other words, get as far away from that edge as possible I think that would be a good thing for you and I to get as far away from the edge of sin possible. Even if it means circumspectly thinking now that we've got to go way out of our way to get to where we're going to stay away from that temptation. First time used, walking in the garden. Second time, Amos says, can two walk together except they be agreed. Third time, walk in the old ways. Fourth time, I'm going to go quickly now. Our, we do have an adversary that's walking 
1 Peter 5, 8, uh, be sober, be vigilant. Why? Because our, the devil, our adversary, walketh, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. You know, Satan's walking out there too. Now, he can't take our salvation, but he sure can rob us of our testimony. He can bring humiliation and embarrassment and pain into our lives and the lives of those that, that we touch when he takes us down. I heard someone say that uh, in Africa, when the lions, they have that uh, pack, that herd of antelope running across, they don't go after it to the fastest, the youngest, the strongest. They wait for one of the antelope that gets separated from the herd. Maybe an elderly one, maybe a young one that can't keep up, maybe one that's sick, and, and when the herd's gone, it's left by himself, and the lions have easy pickings. And of course, we as a church, we're, we're likened maybe not unto a herd of believers, but we are likened unto a, a, a flock of sheep, and we need to flock together. That's why none of us should ever, ever, ever miss church. Don't miss Sunday school. Don't miss the worship hour. You're here. Don't miss tonight. Don't miss Wednesday. Whatever special services are going, do not miss because when we are together, we are strong. Very strong. But when we separate ourselves from the flock, ah, now Satan can pick us off one at a time. And again, I'm not talking about him taking our salvation, but he sure wants to take our testimony. Last time... The word walk is used. We'll all turn there. Pastor, I'll let you close the, the service the way you want to. So if you'll be ready for that in the book of Revelation, way in the back. First time it was used in the book with beginning. Last time the word walk is used is here in Revelation chapter 21, verse, let's see, 22. And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it. For the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. And the nations of them which are baptized shall walk in the light. doesn't say that, does it? Uh, the nations who give the most money shall walk in the light. doesn't say that either. What does it say? And the nations of them which are saved. It's the only way you're going to get to heaven if you have not been saved. If you have not had a time and place in your life when you realized that you were a sinner and you turned from your sin to Christ, accepting Him by faith, you or that one is not saved and cannot go to heaven. That's it. There it is in black and white in the very last book of the Bible talking about heaven. The only people who are there are those who are saved and they shall walk in the light of it. Early on in our ministry at that church downtown, uh, when I went there, there were 17, and, and uh, they, they were hired, in the process of hiring me, and they said, uh, Preacher, uh, all we can afford to pay you is $180. And I had five kids, you know, and even back in 1979, that era, you know, uh, I thought to myself, I'm saying, oh, $180 a week. I don't know if I can do that. So I said, fellas, I don't think I can live on $180 a week. They said, a week? That's for the whole month, preacher. You know. <laughs> so I, was, I, was, I just felt like the Lord wanted me to take it. So I was bivocational for a few years there. And uh, I would uh, go in at 10, get off at 4 or 5 in the morning. And I went in Friday night at 10 o'clock. And then 4 or 5 a.m. on Saturday of course, I'd get off, as I said, and a bunch of people my age, a bunch of guys came along and said, hey, Lapis, they called me by my last name, so-and-so's getting married uh, next week, we're going to have a bachelor's party right now down at the adult club, you want to go? We're going to have a lot of fun. You want to go, Lapis? I said, no. They said, no. I said, that's right. I said, no. They said, well, well, why not? I said, well, I'm a Christian. Well, what do you do for fun then? I says, I go to church. <laughs> Your jaw's about hit the concrete floor. And I, I'm not kidding. The, the most fun I have is when I'm with God's people walking in the light of Christ, as Revelations in 1 John 1 says, walking in the light of Christ. You know, I, I really don't know anybody here that well. Maybe the pastor the best, I would think, obviously. But I'd rather hang out with you folks from Tennessee. <laughs> Then go where those guys wanted me to go. I mean, vile things would be said, filthy language, lustful thoughts, everything that's bad and it'd be under the cover of darkness. The Bible says we should walk in the light 
as he, Christ, is in the light. And we'll have fellowship one with another. We started off in Genesis, walking with Adam and Eve. And we end up in the last book of the Bible, Revelation, walking in the light of heaven. Who will get there? Only those who are saved. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful for the time that's been allotted to us.